Hello, Father. Son, the world we live in today is heading towards the wrong path. All of our social institutions are being infected by a dangerous ideology. If we don't fight back, the damage to society may be irreversible. So before I die, I want you to please do something in my name. Father, I am listening. What do you want me to do? Before my heart surgery, I wrote a really special letter to you. And when the time comes, please take action. My last words to you are this is something you need to focus on. Dad! Dad! Dad. I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. The time has come. Born in New York on May 11, 1966, Bill Ackman is raised in a privileged family where excellence and making billions is part of the norm. His grandfather, Herman, manages to build a thriving real estate business in the early 1920s and becomes the first member of the Ackman family to reach millionaire status. Years later, Bill's father, Lawrence David Ackman, successfully follows Herman's footsteps and takes the family business to new heights. Despite their huge success for both Herman and Lawrence, wealth isn't just about money itself, it is about developing a rich mindset and a relentless drive to be the best possible version of oneself. These values eventually transcend to the next generation and, as Bill is being raised, he learns the importance of always setting an example, to always keep learning and to never give up no matter what the problem is. Although you might dream of being born in a rich family, that's not always an advantage. Shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves is a common saying when it comes to intergenerational wealth transfer. The first generation creates the wealth, the second one stewards it, and the third one consumes it. At a very young age, Bill starts to live up to the expectations of being born in the Ackman family. As a teenager, he starts his own car washing business, where he makes some profit for the first time. Not only does Bill perfectly understand money and entrepreneurship, but he also displays characteristics in his personality that will set him apart from all the other normies. He seeks to have the freedom to do whatever he wants with his life. The biggest driver was independence. I wanted to be able to speak freely, live my life, and that motivated me to be successful. And, you know, I argue with success also comes responsibility. If I see something that's a problem in society, I want to do something about it. Bill's innate qualities and background lay the foundation for the huge controversy that he's going to face against Harvard and the leftist ideology starting in October 2023. But long before becoming an enemy of Harvard and a controversial figure, Bill Ackman was actually a student of Harvard himself and had a left-wing inclination when it came to politics. He was a completely different person to the guy he is today. So just what in the hell happened in Bill Ackman? life that made him change so drastically. I think what the Democratic Party, what left means today, is not a party I want to be associated with. I was a Bill Clinton Democrat, uh, and what the party has sort of morphed to is not something I want anything to do with. 
After graduating high school in 1984 and earning an almost perfect SAT score, Ekman is admitted to Harvard as an undergraduate in social studies. After three years, he graduates with honors and decides to further continue his studies at Harvard. This time, he pursues an MBA and officially starts his journey to reach the top of the financial world. As expected, Bill excels throughout the program and graduates at the very top of his class in 1992 with only 26 years of age. For Lawrence, his son seems to be the perfect candidate to take over the family business. Bill has now become the pride of the Ackman family. However, he doesn't share his father's vision. Bill has something different in his mind. He wants to create his own business empire and not just be worth some pathetic millions. He's aiming for billions. There's also this element of excitement when you deviate from the standard path. A lot of my personal friends who started their careers in hedge funds, private equity, investment banking, consulting, are still very unfulfilled in their careers. And they are still thinking, and sometimes dreaming about taking this one moonshot and doing something different. However, Bill now faces a different problem. Similar to today's generation of lost men in their 20s, he doesn't know exactly what to do with his life. He is passionate about money and business but doesn't know what area to pursue. In the midst of these difficult months of his life, something unexpected happens. Through his family connections, Bill manages to meet the best investor in the history of America, Warren Buffett. By spending time and learning from his wisdom, Bill becomes a strong supporter of Buffett's way of thinking. This experience leads him to find his exact calling in life. He is now set on creating his own investment fund and becoming the next Warren Buffett. Similar to the Tiger management boss Julian Robertson, who inspired a lot of today's hedge funds greats, such as Philippe Lafont and his Cotu management, Warren Buffett inspired a lot of today's billionaire elites, such as Lee Lu, Seth Klarman, and many more, such as Bill Ackman. However, Lawrence is not happy at all. He believes that Bill should work in the family company and expand it further. But the attempt to convince his son is meaningless. Bill is determined to make his newfound dream a reality. Actually, my father, who's here, he, he, he came with us. Uh, that's dad over there in the corner. Uh, you can ask him whatever questions you want afterwards. Um, he told me it was a really dumb idea to start an investment fund right out of business school. So later, during his graduation year, he decides to start his own investment fund alongside a Harvard colleague of his, David Berkowitz. They name it Gotham Partners. In 2000, after several successful investments, Gotham Partners commands $568 million AUM. In less than a decade, Bill has finally become the person he strived for as a kid. He has become rich by his efforts and now has the freedom to do whatever he wants with his life. Yet, despite all the money, Bill discovers something even more valuable, a true passion for investment activism. Activist investors use their equity stakes in order to exert pressure on a company's management. There's many options to achieve that, but some of them involve things such as proxy battles, negotiations with management, or, believe it or not, the good old shit posting. Shortly after reaching its peak, Gotham Partners starts receiving various lawsuits from other companies as a result of its controversial investment strategies. This is where Bill Ackman faces his first major setback in his professional career. A bond insurer company named MBIA sues Gotham Partners for allegedly spreading false and misleading information to manipulate the market. Bill had shorted the company and publicly stated that it was overvalued and that their business model was at risk. After a long back and forth, Bill loses this intense legal battle and causes Gotham Partners to wind down in 2002. For beta fund managers, the fall of their first fund often means they cannot ever raise capital again. Yet for Bill, being a different breed, the scenario is different. He sees the fall of his fund as an opportunity to show the world what he is made of. Ackman moves fast and after two years of analyzing past mistakes and refining his strategy, he decides to start a new hedge fund in 2004. 
Today, its name is synonymous with prestige and gets every MBA graduate excited. Pershing Square Capital. Bill's mission is still the same, to become the next Warren Buffett and someday become a billionaire. Just as he desired, it was the start of Pershing Square that made Ackman reach a higher level of wealth fame and power. In the mid-2000s, he gains a significant amount of attention due to his high-profile investments in companies like Wendy's, McDonald's and Target. Moreover, in 2012, his popularity skyrockets due to his $1 billion short position against Herbalife and his media battle against Carl Icahn, another highly influential billionaire investor. Ackman is a liar, okay? Not an honest guy. And this is not a guy who keeps his word, and this is a guy who takes, takes advantage of little people. After nine years of growing Pershing Square, Bill finally reaches billionaire status. According to Forbes, his net worth hit 1.2 billion for the first time in 2013. He is even nicknamed Baby Buffett by the finance community and is now considered one of the most savvy hedge fund managers in America. Nonetheless, after one more decade of order and prosperity, the duality of life strikes back at Bill. It is now 2022 and Lawrence Ackman finds himself extremely sick. He has a very serious heart condition. Before being diagnosed with it, Lawrence had survived both lung and prostate cancer. So the probability of him surviving one more time is slim. Lawrence himself has an intuition that this time he won't make it. So he starts thinking deeply about about the legacy he is going to leave to the world. There are still many problems that he wants to solve, but he no longer has the time to do so. As his condition worsens, Lawrence Ackman decides to write a letter to his son, entrusting him with his desire to prevent the spread of a dangerous ideology. Son, we are Jewish, and only because of that, many powerful people are against us. In their eyes, we are privileged oppressors. You must use your power to fight against anti-Semitism and the DEI ideology. I want my last words to you to be that you should focus on solving this problem. Lawrence Ackman passes away on May 31st, 2022, and despite his death, Bill still prioritizes his desire to grow richer over the wish of his father. His dream of becoming the next Warren Buffett is still more powerful than that. He tells himself that anti-Semitism isn't as big of a problem. He doesn't see it in his day-to-day -day life, so he believes that it is not a problem worth his time. My dad would say, Bill, you're just not doing enough about anti-Semitism. I think it's a really important problem. You need to focus on it. And I was very dismissive of my dad. And, uh, dad uh, had heart surgery coming up and he was very concerned about it because it was kind of life or death. And he wrote me three letters. One was, here are my instructions. If I die, you know, memorial service, etc. This is what I want you to do with your mom, financial state planning. The third one was like you know, a long letter about anti-Semitism. He said, look, Bill, I want my last words to you to be, this is something you need to focus on. And I didn't do anything, to be honest. And then October 7th happened. But only 18 months after Lawrence's death, an unpredictable incident changes everything. More than 700 Israelis are now feared dead after unprecedented attacks by Hamas militants. For the first time, Lawrence's letter starts to make sense for Bill. It is now extremely meaningful to him. He can finally see what his father was worried about. As a result, the war with Harvard is about to begin. I can't believe I'm saying this and I can't believe that we as a country are having to do this. Seeing a Holocaust denial-like phenomenon evolving in real time. Only one day after Hamas invades Israel, 34 Harvard student associations issue a joint statement condemning the Jewish country and proclaiming their support for Palestine. Bill believes that these claims are utterly unacceptable. He cannot comprehend what he is reading. A fire sets ablaze inside his heart and he has a strong 
intuition that something is not okay. He isn't wrong. One day later, a leadership entity at Harvard, composed of the president Claudine Gay and the board of elites, issues their first signed letter about the conflict. The response of the campus community is extremely divided. Both sides believe that Claudine Gay is siding with the enemy. For Bill and the Jewish community, the statement has failed to condemn Hamas for their actions. On the other hand, Palestine supporters think otherwise. They interpret the letter as if Harvard is siding with Israel due to their emphasis on Israeli deaths. In the middle of all this controversy, Harvard President Claudine Gay issues yet another letter to clear things up. On the 10th of October, she states the following. As the events of recent days continue to reverberate, let there be no doubt that I condemn the terrorist atrocities perpetrated by Hamas. Let me also state that while our students have the right to speak for themselves, no student group speaks for Harvard University or its leadership. We will all be well served in such a difficult moment by rhetoric that aims to illuminate and not inflame. The Harvard campus remains confused. The letter is still too ambiguous and there is no information of value. Bill believes that Harvard is not clear enough and that they should do more for the Jewish community. Words are not enough. As a result of this, President Gay receives a lot of backlash and is now pressured by the board to release a clearer statement regarding the situation. As days pass by and the war between Hamas and Israel escalates, the problem at Harvard reaches a different stage. There is an outbreak of many pro-Palestinian protests on campus. These protests had gone from reasonably benign to anti-Semitism activity on campus. Jewish students were under attack and the university did nothing. There was no proper punishment to violent attitudes like hundreds of students calling for the genocide of all Jews and bullying. According to Bill, these activities undermined the code of conduct at Harvard and deserved punishment by their own policy. Bill has a solid argument. He compared the response of Harvard on this incident to that of when George Floyd was killed and the Black Lives Matter movement was at its peak. At that time, any attitude that hinted a bias against the Black Lives Matter movement at Harvard was strictly condemned by the university with either punishment or suspension. As a result, there is more division. Some people stand with Harvard, but many disagree. Prominent finance magnates take action. Hedge fund billionaire and Harvard old boy Ken Griffin then created a storm by saying he wouldn't employ any student who'd signed that statement. But if you sign that letter, no, I'm, I'm not going to hire you. I don't have to. Bill is extremely angry. He cannot believe how badly Harvard is handling the situation. He is busy, he has things to do, money to make, but his heart keeps telling him to use his power to fight back. Bill decides to personally attend the Harvard campus and to speak to Jewish students on the topic. They all say the same thing. The institution is not punishing any type of anti-Semitic activity. It is getting worse with each passing day. For Bill, it is as if Harvard has become a shell of what it used to be when he was a student. As a result of Harvard's lack of leadership and governance, Bill sends a personal letter to the president and board of Harvard. He explains that things are going in the wrong direction and that he has some ideas about how to fix the ongoing issues. It is the 4th of November and Bill hasn't achieved anything. He is tired of waiting and being the stubborn person that he is, he resorts to taking all of this to the public eye. Bill writes yet another letter, but this time he will also post it on X for the world to see. He's part of the new wave of billionaires directly taking control of the media narrative by building their own distribution, like the guys from the All In Pot or Elon Musk of course. The letter criticizes Harvard for their lack of punishment against hate-motivated anti-Semitic actions. He also explicitly blames Harvard for their lack of leadership and lack of accountability. Throughout the long letter, Bill emphasizes that 
that Harvard needs to foster an environment for open debate and different perspectives instead of silencing opinions that go contrary to what is popular. Harvard remains silent, but the world has finally heard Bill Ackman's voice. The growing social media outrage shines a light on Bill's story. As a partial result of his actions, the presidents of Harvard, MIT and UPenn are invited to a congressional hearing by Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. Elizabeth Megal, Sally Kornblatt and Claudine Gay are all being investigated for anti-Semitic discrimination on their respective campus. They are all in big trouble. During the day of the congressional hearing, the presidents of some of the most renowned and powerful educational institutions in the world manifest a condescending attitude against the congressmen, smirking, giving low effort answers, not caring, having arrogant body language. In brief, they are all being extremely disrespectful. But there is one moment in the hearing that uncovered the hidden agenda that all of these educational institutions have. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. It can be anti-Semitic, depending on the context. If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment. Bill Ackman is enraged by this answer and resorts to sharing it with his million followers on X immediately. He can't believe what he just heard. The tweet goes viral and makes newspaper headlines. A whopping 100 million views in 24 hours. Finally, the world is waking up to the flaws and unacceptable behaviors that these leaders have. If you think about it, these three women all represent different educational institutions and yet they all have the same answers and attitudes against anti-semitism. You might wonder why this is the case. The truth is that the framework of all of these universities is rooted in the same leftist ideology, DEI, diversity, equity and inclusiveness. Let's be honest, university education isn't what it used to be. But also, wow, the video editing and the storytelling on this video, it's immaculate. Thank you, man. Thank you. Nico and Vlad are both senior members of my company that builds YouTube channels. Given that university is not what it used to be, we came up with a plan. We will teach you how to make writing scripts or editing videos your career. Just like we do here at Megalomedia. Introducing Creator Base. Creator Base is a community based platform where you will learn how to make a living online by us teaching you high income skills in the YouTube space like script writing or strategy. Our detailed courses and live lectures will help you take your scripts and edits to the next level so that you can create videos like the one you're watching right now. The goal of our community is clear. We set standards in script writing and video editing so that we can all achieve financial freedom. At Creator Base, you will learn more and work harder than ever before. At Creator Base, you'll make friends who push you to be better. At Creator Base, you'll make YouTube your full-time career. Click the link in the description below to find out more about Creator Base. When Bill talked with his allies and the Jewish students at Harvard, they all told him the same thing. The reason why Harvard is not punishing anti-Semitism on campus is because the institution uses the DEI ideology as its framework for education. And that's when I went up on campus and I started talking to the faculty. And that's when I started hearing about, actually Bill, it's, it's this DEI ideology. Now this channel tries to stay clear of politics usually, right? First and foremost, we're capitalists. But I think what we're going to talk about in the following segment is going to touch your life if you attempt to build an ambitious career. Society is more divided than ever, it seems. I think it's important for you to know the history behind the DEI ideology to make up your own mind. Before we dive deep into the implications of DEI, we have to understand that the world has always been divided by right-wing and left-wing ideologies. Both of these groups believe that the world would be better off if society adopted their thinking. Right-wing intellectuals believe in individual liberty, the preservation of traditional values and a limited government role in a country's management structure. On the contrary, left-wing intellectuals supposedly strive for government 
government involvement and a world with no inequality. With this said, here is where conservative politician Christopher Rufo joins the story. He has dedicated his life's work to finding the truth about the left-wing agenda and its goals. Rufo believes that the left no longer stands for what it once used to. He is on a mission to change society for good. And so that was my political formation. I went to get my undergraduate degree at Georgetown with the intention of being involved in left-wing politics. The first thing that disillusioned me was finding out that left-wing politics in the United States is not for the common man. It's not to uplift uh, the, 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 the downtrodden. Um, it's about maintaining its the, their own status and prestige with the institutions. It's like a McKinsey consultant kind of worldview with the trappings of the left. It's the Harvard student who's wearing the Palestinian kefia who then goes on to, you know, uh, become an investment banker. Mm. Uh, and it's like, to me, it was so phony. It was a profoundly phony and empty political movement run by the sons and daughters of American elites for their own benefit. Everything starts in 1968 when far left-wing Marxist intellectuals face a dilemma. Their goal is to abolish class distinctions through a middle-class proletariat that overthrows the capitalist system. They want a society where everything is commonly owned and controlled by the government. However, after World War II, there is a common consensus that this idea has failed, both in the eastern and the western parts of the world. In the Soviet Union, Marxist ideology has descended into bureaucratic tyranny, gulags and extreme methods of suppression. In America and Europe, the working class doesn't want a revolution. They are satisfied and happy with their standard of living and aren't seeking to to overthrow capitalism as the left had planned. The working class, in which Karl Marx had invested all of his hopes as the revolutionary proletariat, had actually transformed culturally and become not just non-revolutionary, but in fact anti-revolutionary. People in the United States that were in the middle and working classes were largely satisfied with the rapidly rising standard of living, with a level of material comfort that had been unknown in all of human history to the common citizen. Instead of giving up on Marxism, left-wing intellectuals start developing an alternative structure to implement their revolutionary ideology. As Hitler takes over Europe, a German philosopher named Herbert Marcuse immigrates to the United States to manifest his newly designed critical theory. Critical theory, on the other hand, was a theory that sought to expose and undermine and demythologize existing social institutions to then convert or transform them towards the complete liberation of society. And so these critical theories, and most specifically coming from Herbert Marcuse, became really the dominant philosophy of left-wing ideology and left-wing politics of that era. In other words, Marcuse aims to infiltrate schools, universities, companies, and even the government to spread his leftist framework. He believes that by doing this he will change society's view of the world into one that favors social justice and equality. Even if it takes decades, he believes that it is the best way to save the world from capitalism. As years pass, Marcuse's critical theory evolves into one of the most popular social frameworks of modern times, the critical race theory. Critical race theory maintains that the United States is a fundamentally racist country and that all of its institutions, from the constitution, to the law, to the nuclear family, to the uh, social institutions, manners and mores, preach the values of liberty and equality, but these are really just smoke screens for mm -hmm. naked mm -hmm. racial domination. Mm -hmm. The most surprising thing, this ideology was led by a black Harvard law professor named Derek Bell. The godfather of critical race theory was a black Harvard law professor named Derek Bell, who was hired as the first full-time black law professor at Harvard in the late 1960s. And Bell is a really fascinating person. He set the tone of critical race theory. It's an ideology of, of extreme cynicism, negative philosophy, a kind of negation-based philosophy. And he cultivated a network of young students. He was a very charismatic figure, uh, uh, wrote a series of books, kind of allegorical books, talking about how uh, racism was the permanent, indestructible, and overwhelming feature of the United States. By gaining a lot of support from marginalized groups in America, the critical race theory rapidly began to spread in academia, K-12 education, the federal government, 
government and Fortune 500 companies. For the past year and a half, I've reported on critical race theory uh, in the federal government, in at least a third of the Fortune 100 companies, uh, in K-12 education systems that are educating collectively millions of upon millions of American kids. And it seems like that march through the institutions, which was first proposed in 1968, has achieved a position of dominance. They outlined in their hope and ambitions, uh, starting in 68, continuing to 1987, and now achieving what is very close to hegemony or intellectual dominance within the institutions today. As bad as it sounds, this was just the start. According to Rufo, we are facing an even greater problem today. We have a new problem now. The bureaucracies of American life have been ideologized. They've been captured and then infused with an ideology of really critical race theory, but then euphemized as diversity, equity, and inclusion. We see this everywhere. We see this in government. We see this in universities. We see this in K through 12 schools. We see this even in private corporations, really all of which, the top 100 corporations in the United States have now bowed down to the ideology of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it gets even worse. For Bill Ackman, what concerns him the most is that the DEI ideology promotes the oppressor versus oppressed framework. This is a framework that is currently being taught as the backbone of Harvard's education and was first originated by Karl Marx as a critique of capitalism and middle-class struggle. And they started talking to me about this oppressor-oppressed framework, which is effectively taught on campus and represents the backdrop for many of the courses that are offered and some of the studies and other degree offerings. I had not even heard of this. And you know, I'm a pretty aware person, uh, but I was completely unaware. And basically they're like, look, Israel is deemed an oppressor and the Palestinians are deemed the oppressed, and you take the side of the oppressed. And any acts of the oppressed to dislodge the oppressor, regardless of how vile or barbaric, I'm like, okay, this is a super dangerous ideology. After the controversial hearing, the world has finally been a witness to Harvard's true identity. By openly admitting that calling for the genocide of Jews doesn't strictly violate Harvard's code of conduct, it becomes evident that Harvard, MIT and UPenn deem Israel as the oppressor and Palestine as the oppressed. But more than that, this is a testament that the initial critical theory, now dressed as DEI, has finally taken over universities. In other words, it is exactly what Herbert Marcuse and Derek Bell had envisioned many years ago. As a media scandal unfolds, the world is waiting for Claudine Gay to resign from her position as the president of Harvard. It is now evident that she has made an unforgivable mistake and deserves to be punished. The days pass by and Harvard remains silent. So, on the 10th of December, Bill writes another letter to his former university. Given his previous success, he shares it on X yet again. Dear members of the Harvard Governing Boards, in her short tenure as president, Claudine Gay has done more damage to the reputation of Harvard University than any individual in our nearly 500 year history. The tweet goes viral again, and the pressure is back on Harvard's side. Harvard has no option but to respond. The right wing is at its throat. They can't hide for long. So two days after Bill's open letter, Harvard's corporation board finally issues a statement expressing their position on the current events. Obviously, everyone is expecting that this letter is going to be about Claudine Gay's resignation. However, the reality is the complete opposite. The board declares that they are in full support support of Claudine Gay. All of the 33 members support the idea that she should stay. Not only that, they explicitly condemn all of the attacks that she has received. In this tumultuous and difficult time, we unanimously stand in support of President Gay. At Harvard, we champion open discourse and academic freedom, and we are united in our strong belief that calls for violence against our students and disruptions of the classroom experience will not be tolerated. Harvard's mission is advancing knowledge, research, and discovery that will help address deep societal issues and promote constructive discourse. And we are confident that President Gay will 
will lead Harvard forward toward accomplishing this vital work. The world is in shock, and as the controversy keeps growing, Bill wants to get to the root of the problem. He wonders why the entire board supports President Gay. I mean, shouldn't the board be composed of both liberal and conservative viewpoints? After doing a lot of research, Bill finds out that there is a huge systematic flaw in how the board of Harvard is structured. The governance structure is a disaster. So the way it works today is Harvard has two principal boards. There's the board of the corporation, the so-called fellows of Harvard. It's a board of, uh, I think, 12 independent directors and the president. There's no shareholder vote. There's no proxy system. It's really a self-perpetuating board that elects its, effectively elects its own members. Once it becomes, once the balance tips politically one way or another, it can be kept that way forever. There's no kind of rebalancing system. You know, if a U.S. corporation goes off the rails, so to speak, the shareholders can get together and vote off the directors. There's no ability to vote off the directors. Then there's the board of overseers, which is, I think, 32 uh, directors. And there, a few years ago, if you could put together 600 signatures, you could run for that board and put up a bunch of candidates and about five or six get elected each year. And a group did exactly that. And it was an oil and gas kind of disinvestment uh, group. Uh, they got the signatures, a couple of them got elected, and uh, Harvard then changed the rules. They said, now we need 3,200 signatures. On top of this, a recent survey done at Harvard reveals an even more disturbing truth. You know, there was a survey done, I don't know, a year or so ago, of the Harvard faculty, and only 2% of the faculty admitted, even in an anonymous survey, admitted to being having a conservative point of view. So we have a campus that's 98% non-conservative, liberal, progressive, uh, that's adopted this DEI construct. And this, and that I learned from a member of the search committee for the Harvard president that they were restricted in looking at candidates, only those who met the DEI offices criteria. And I shared this in one of my postings and I was accused of being a racist. After all of this information is out in the public, many right-wing activists start a collective investigation on the president. In December of 2023, Christopher Rufo receives a message from a colleague. A treasurer appears out of nowhere. There is proof that Claudine Gay has plagiarized sex of her university thesis. With this, Rufo has the power in his hands to finally make justice. Even though it isn't the reason everyone wanted Gay to resign from her position, it will still send a powerful message to the world. There is resistance against the left who will not back down. Little Birdie sent uh, another reporter and me a document showing that actually Claudine Gay, you know, great scholar of Harvard, had plagiarized dozens of passages in her PhD thesis. And so in this context of this big fight, you get a document like this and you say, this actually reveals the heart of this conflict. As a result of these findings, Harvard alumni, donors, and even faculty members finally turn their back on President Gay. She's done for. Just to put that into perspective for all the capitalists that don't care too much about academia watching this channel, plagiarism in academia is like insider trading in business. It's not a small mistake. As a result of this new controversy, on the 2nd of January, Harvard issues yet another letter, this time personally written and signed by Claudine Gay herself. The open letter says the following. Dear members of the Harvard community, with great sadness, we write in light of President Claudine Gay's message announcing her intention to step down from the presidency and resume her faculty position at Harvard. Finally, Claudine Gay resigns as the president of Harvard. Bill Ackman opens a whiskey and celebrates in his multi-million dollar apartment in New York. It seems that justice has finally been served. This is a win for democracy. Harvard's true agenda is finally exposed for the world to see. However, the sad reality is that the problem is far from over. This story shows that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Claudine Gay's resignation reveals to the world the true nature of the the DEI ideology and its ability to exercise power in society. They are already in control of America's most prestigious social institutions and are spreading their ideology to the younger generations without allowing them room for questioning. Our freedoms are being challenged and we should stay vigilant to separate truth from lies. Claudine Gay is resigning as president of Harvard University. WBZ obtained... Your wife, Neri Oxman, is being targeted by the left. 